Okay, so now let's look at the last component in data pre-processing, okay? And that's data transformation and discretization. Um, so data transformation is just the process of changing the format, structure, or values uh, of the data. So given our data set here, okay, we can transform an attribute into a new value from existing attributes, right? We apply some function, okay? And we can create a new value here, okay? So essentially we're just mapping some existing variable, apply some function, we can map it into something different, okay? Uh, so now let's look at some of the methods that we can use in data transformation, okay? Now, if you recall, um, there's kind of a little bit of overlap between other uh, major data preprocessing tasks that we've looked at. Um, as you can see, the first three here, we've already looked at this, right? Um, I'll quickly just do an overview. We've already looked at smoothing, attribute selection, aggregation, right? Uh, smoothing here, um, we just remove the unnecessary or meaningless data, what we call as uh, noisy data, right? Uh, from the data set. So why do we do this? Uh, we want to improve the algorithm or algorithm's ability to detect useful patterns in the data, okay? Um, again, here we talk about attribute selection. We've already looked at this, uh, but I want to emphasize here, right, that you can actually create a new attribute. So we can create new attributes from existing ones, okay? So just, just based on this, um, we, we can improve the uh, efficiency in analyzing, uh, simplifying the process uh, on our original data, okay? In fact, um, in R, we have this package called deploy, right? So this is a function, it's actually a verb. So deploy has different verbs, I think almost five, right? One of the verb is called mutate it's just a function so this mutate takes the following arguments so within this parenthesis right so this will be the data frame data frame here just just uh, our data set in form of rows and columns then our new variables right so let's say here uh, our existing variables were probably we want to create a new variable maybe uh, let's say uh, weekly right now existing variable here, uh, let's say it's monthly, right? So a new variable here will be weekly, right? So we wanna create weekly. So our existing in our data frame, in our table here, okay, we know that we have a column here uh, called monthly revenue, right? So we could actually apply a function here. So monthly divide by, to get weekly, maybe divide by four, okay? So uh, whatever revenue you get per month divided by four, you should be able to get your weekly. And that's it, okay. Uh, yeah, so this is attribute selection, okay. Um, we can actually use a deploy package in R, right? And use mutate to do that. You know, hopefully we're gonna look at that. And then aggregation here, um, basically it's just collecting or gathering uh, a number of, uh, sources, data from different sources, and sorting it into a single format, right? Now, while we do aggregation, we've already looked at that, we want to improve the quality of our data. When we started data pre-processing, we looked at why it's important to look at, uh, to have high quality data, right? This will lead into, you know, uh, accurate results, right? So we gather the data and, and put that into clusters or collect lots of data. Okay, but really here we want to look at normalization. This is our, 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 our task here. So there are two methods or two approaches we're gonna look at. So we have minimax and z-score, right? So what's normalization here? So it's an important step in data transformation. If you're gonna uh, engage, when you're gonna be a data scientist, then this is the first step. You know, once you have data, you've done some cleaning, right? Uh, the next step is to normalize your data, okay? Uh, sometimes just called pre-processing, okay? So you wanna categorize your data into a given range, maybe maybe between zero and one, 
right? So you could have data uh, spread on, on different scales, you know, maybe salary of 10,000, another one has a salary of, a salary of uh, probably $1 million, right? So you wanna normalize that, so that it just falls within a uh, uh, uniform scale, okay? So let's look at an example here, right? A visual here. So, so in the next example here, so in this plot, we have two uh, attributes or two variables. One is called years old, and another one is called number of rooms, right? Just by visual uh, inspection here, we can see that years old has data points spread from zero to 100. In fact, there's, a, there's quite a widespread, there's a high variance here, okay? So I could pick a data point here. There's quite a bit of big difference between this data point and probably this data point. Okay. However, if you look at the y-axis, right, um, all the data kind of cuts off here, right? But the y-axis, there's much more spread happening here. Okay. Now, the why we perform normalization here is because, for example, if you're gonna use PCA, right? If you apply PCA, PCA will look at the data and it will tell us or it will, it will give more importance on this attribute, years old, right? And and not so much on the y-axis number of rooms. But now this is misleading, you know, this is ne not very true. And that's why we need to normalize that. So if you recall PCA, you'll see now, uh, let assume that our PCA component here, you know, uh, this is the variance you now kind of gives more importance onto our first uh, attributes here and not so much on the second uh, attribute so and this is the idea here okay um and you can see here the only difference on y-axis is because it can take more data points right and zero to 20 so it kind of bias kind of bias so we need to do normalization so right now you can see here for this example um there's a huge difference between a house with two rooms and a house with 20 rooms, right? Right, so if this is the number of rooms, uh, we can have zero here and 20, probably, okay. Uh, but I, like I said, it's misleading, okay? Anyway, so what we need to do here is to do min-max normalization. Let's try and fix this. So with normalization, suppose you're given uh, the following, right? So you have an income range of 12,000 to 98,000. So we want to normalize this to a uniform range of zero to one, right? So we want to map this. So essentially here, this will be, uh, actually zero will become 12,000. This will be our new minimum, right? New, uh, sorry, new minimum here, okay? And then we map one, for our max here, 98,000, right? So this would be our 98,000, our max, okay? So this would be one, one minus zero, remember that. But anyway, we plug it here. So we want to map this 73,600. So V here would be our new variable, right? Minus, our minimum here is 12,000 divided by max would be 98,000 minus minimum 12,000. Then we map that into this range. Remember, we cannot map uh, we made, you know, zero to be 12,000, so it'll be 12,000 here. Actually, this will be zero, and then this will be one, plus the new minimum, right? Okay, so, and that will be based on this formula. So let's go here. That's why we have this formula here. Uh, let's go. So if we transform that, you can see we just plug in the numbers. Um, again, this will be our new minimum, and we have this. Okay, and that's normalization, right? So remember, the min-max normalization here tries to preserve the relationships, you know, in the original data, okay? All right, so now let's again look at a visual uh, a scatter plot here. So using min-max, you can see, um, you know, the data is kind of spread here, you know, it's well distributed here. Right, x axis that's from zero to one, zero to one. Right, not not bad, but actually there's a problem. You know, 
even though the goal of normalization here is to make every data point, right? All these are the, the blue dots are data points to be on the same scale, zero, one, zero, one, okay? But now to have an equal importance, right? But now there's a problem. We still have a problem with min-max. Let's say, suppose, suppose we have probably 99 values, right? So this is an, a normalized data. Suppose we have 99 values, right? And they range from zero to uh, 40. Right, and one value is 100. Okay, so what that means, 99 values will range between zero and 40. So when we perform normalization, notice what happens. All these 99 values, right, will fall within the range from zero to 0 0.4, right? Well, it might look much better and the data is squished, kind of spread out, but on the x-axis is spread from zero to 0 0.4, okay? But on the y-axis, it spread from zero to one, uh, and this is the goal here, right? We want to make sure the data is squished from zero to one and zero to 1.0, right? So again, the uh, there's a problem here, okay? Now, you can see that we have an outlier here. It's a ridiculous data point, okay? Uh, still, you know, takes the maximum, okay? So essentially we're saying with min-max, it doesn't handle outliers very well, okay? Because you can see on our x-axis, the ranges uh, fall from zero to 0 0.4 and y-axis from zero to 1.0, right? And this is not what we want, right? So now let's look at a better approach and that's why <clears throat> Most times we want to use Z score normalization. Okay. This is a very popular, uh, a very, very popular approach. Okay. Um, it's given by this formula. So I hope you still remember the symbols here. So this is the mean and standard deviation, right? So suppose we have, or for example, we have a mean as 54,000, standard deviation 16,000, and we want to transform this data. Okay. We want to map that. So we plug it in and it will be something similar to this, right? So we have a variable here, 3,600 minus 4,000 divided by 16,000, get this number, okay? And that's z-score, right? But if we were to visualize this, given an example, but uh, a moment here. So anyway, the min-max here, so one thing to keep in mind when we talk about min-max normalization, kind of it guarantees all features will have the exa exact same scale but might not handle, uh, this might not handle outliers very well. But Z-score here, you know, can handle outliers, but probably doesn't produce normalized data or the exam exact same scale, but it's way much better. Let's look at an example here. Okay, so with the uh, min-max, rather with Z-score, you could see here, um, the data doesn't look very squished. So this is the normalized uh, houses we have the years old and number of rooms right now what happened here what do you see okay so what happens here so assume that in uh our mean is actually at zero here so any data point fall uh, that falls on the left hand side um you know that those are the negative points so actually our scale here is from negative two to two from negative two to two here, okay? So these are positive values. Anything greater than the mean, assuming this is our mean or our center point, that positive, right? Anything uh, uh, on the left-hand side is negative, right? Now, the good thing here, we have all our data points, right? Uh, still within the boundaries here, negative two and positive two and the same here, okay? But still, we have this problem, but that's okay right? This will be treated as an outlier, and you can actually decide whether to remove that. But again, we can see all our data points now uh, are actually squished within the same, you know, scale. And in fact, you know, uh, uh, I'll highly rec recommend this. If you are going to do data analysis, you can actually compare and see in terms of performance, right? You can use both uh, Zisco, MinMax, you know, uh, get the performance, right? Get the accuracy, percentage and see which one gives you the better uh, performance, okay? So that's just the way it is for now. 
Uh, and then a last one here, I just wanted to introduce here decimal scaling, very simple. Suppose we have maybe values ranging from, uh, values of uh, ranging from negative 9.86 to 9.17. So decimal scaling is very simple. What you do, you just divide this by, uh, in our case here, you can divide this by maybe uh, a thousand, given that this is, you know, uh, so how do we get a thousand? So, you know, these are three digits, right? And then divide this by a thousand as well. So what does that give you? So what that means, that would be just decimal that, to decimal 9.17, that's decimal scale. Okay. All right. So now let's look at the last step here in data transformation. We have discretization. Um, again, we've already looked at that, binning cluster. Um, but now let's look at what discretization is, right? Uh, discretization, we just want to divide the range of continuous attributes into intervals, right? What that means is that we want to convert large number of data values into smaller ones, okay? So that now it becomes easier for evaluation, right? And management becomes very easy. All right, so let's look at an example here. So let's say you're given this data, right? So age, so our attribute, this is our attribute, and we have continuous variables here from 10 all the way to 75. So before discretization, it will look like this, but once we discretize the data, right, it will look like this, right? Um, it's easier to work with continuous variable. In fact, in the real world, most of our data is continuous attributes okay and uh, based on this we can discretize this and we can say this is here in fact you can actually go ahead and say okay so from 10 here to 18 right 18 you can uh, classify that or you know use a nominal classification here as as here right or maybe ordinal in our case here. then 30 okay to 42 here um, that's mature and 70 to 75, right? And this is the power of discretization actually, right? Um, and in, in some literature, you can actually go ahead and use decision trees, right? Where well, you use, um, you can actually use a tree tree map, kind of decision tree just is just a, a, a hierarchical tree map where you can use a yes, no kind of uh, questions to produce a very compact and accurate results of discrete values. Okay. And, and as you can see here, uh, again, one thing I wanted to mention here. So using these continuous attributes, right? Uh, we can see that we can significantly improve the efficiency or rather efficiency of your analysis, right? We can replace some of these values with a constant, okay, a constant, quality attribute, see, 10 to 18, 30 to 42, 70 to 75, right? Uh, which essentially are just discrete values, okay? So much for that. Now let's uh, go ahead here, but really how, what, what, what techniques or what methods can we use for discretization, okay? So we've already looked, we've already seen binning, you know, here, we saw how we can do binning by means, right? Binning is just putting your data into buckets. We saw different methods we could use here by mean, right? Uh, equal frequency and equal width. So width, you know, boundaries, you know, we saw that, okay? We saw also by boundaries, right? Okay. Uh, histogram analysis, we've already looked at that. We discussed that. Uh, again, we've looked at clustering. Then lastly here, we wanna discuss this, okay? Now, so this is a fairly simple operation. So let's say you're given the following location-oriented attributes. So we have street, country, and, and, and a state and city, right? It's a fairly simple operation. So we need to create some hierarchy. So just, Based on this, you know, can can you just think of what? So, if you were to generate some distinct um, attributes from this, uh, uh, um, uh, actually from our features here, which one do you think probably will have, you know, uh, the less amount of uh, distinct values? Okay, just think of that. 
which will have the less amount of distinct values. Is it street, country, state, or city? Well, that will be a country. So let's look at an example here. So what I'm saying here is that you could have this. So let's say country you can end up having 15 distinct values, right? And then state, you can have over 300 distinct values, right? Um, then city, we can have plenty of different values, right? And then streets, now we can have over 600 or, or uh, around 700,000 uh, values, okay? So that's just the concept hierarchy. You, you're trying to create some hierarchy here, you know, based from top down, right? You know, it's almost like a tree-based uh uh, kind of e evaluation here yeah and that's it for now so and that concludes um, our data pre-processing so far uh, we've already looked at data cleaning so how to handle missing and noisy data we looked at data integration data reduction we looked at pca attribute you know where we looked at forward and backward selection right so and you can actually combine these two right uh, both forward and backward selection, right? Uh, again, here we looked at numerosity, you know, when you want to reduce the volume of your data, okay? Uh, either through parametric or non-parametric methods, right? We've looked at data uh, compression, you know, lossy and lossless. We say that uh, when you're looking at lossy, this is most common with uh, audio uh, and video mostly, right? And then lossless here, very common with uh, string compression. You can actually, you know, compress and still, uh, you know, regenerate that back to original data in its purest form, okay, without losing any information. Then we've already now look at data discretization, right? Using histogram, min max, z score normalization. Um, all these are just different overlap, okay? And that marks the end of our. Uh, data pre-processing um, topic. All right, thank you.